So in this clip we're going to talk about data generating processes and data models and what's the difference. We're going to concentrate on univariate processes and let's call it YT just for privacy reason. So there will be two different things we need to differentiate. The DTPs, data generating processes, and the data models. They're really two different things but somehow we need to move them together or match these and that's the purpose of this clip to explain how in principle we do this. So in order to achieve this there's going to be some link between these two and we will point out what that is later. So let's start with the DGP. So we could write down any sort of univariate model. So we could start with that. For instance, you could think of an ARP process on MA, ARMA, ARIMA process, details of that in another place, but any sort of model, and there are many different ones. For argument's sake, let's use an example. Let's use an AR2 model, and let's just briefly write that down. YT is a function of basically a linear function of yt minus 1, yt minus 2, with these two parameters phi 1, phi 2, and the error term is assumed to be iid distributed with zero mean and variance sigma squared. So once you've written down this process, there's a number of key pieces of information. Firstly, the type of the DGP, here the AR2, and then the parameters alpha, phi1, phi2, and sigma squared. So it is the combination of this type of DGP and the parameter values, so here alpha, phi1, phi2, and sigma squared for parameters, that completely determines the dynamic properties of YT. So how YT evolves is totally determined by the DGP type and the parameter values. The next question is then how do we actually capture these dynamic properties? Or how do we measure them? Would be one way of saying that. Or how do we describe these? So it turns out what we will mainly use is what is called the autocorrelation function or short ACF. Now, what's hidden behind that is basically a collection of correlations. The correlation between yt and a lag of yt. Let's call it yt minus j. And for short, we shall call that rho j. Okay, so there are many what are called autocorrelations, because correlation with itself, but in the lagged version, the chafed lag. And we will also be interested in the stationarity property. So this is how we describe the dynamics, the stationarity property and the functions of the autocorrelations. If you have an MA process, we'll also be interested in invertibility. How it turns out, both stationarity and invertibility is a combination of the DGP type and parameters, but nevertheless, it's worth mentioning here. So here is the first element of this link. It is these descriptions of the dynamic properties, the rho j's for positive j's, okay, so we have first order autocollation, second order autocollation, and so forth, and the stationarity property, potentially invertibility as well, but for simplicity I'll leave that away. So what we've done so far, we discussed what are basically theoretical properties of a particular data generating process. So far we haven't used any data whatsoever. So what, however, if we have a particular data set? So we have observations for a series YT and we have observations from, let's say, 1 to capital T. So we have capital T observations. The key to understand is that we don't know what the data generating process of these data are. 
we're, all we see is the data. We don't know what really produces them, and it's unlikely, in fact, it's anything as simple as an AR2. However, what we can do is that we can obtain sample estimates or sample equivalents of these autocorrelations of the road J's. Okay, and the theoretical collection of road J's was called the autocorrelation function. The sample equivalent we shall call the sample autocorrelation function. Okay? Therefore, SACF, the sample autocorrelation function. And in terms of the stationarity property, we can perform a hypothesis test. Uh, you, you will have or will learn about a uh, Dickey Fuller test on the stationarity property of our data. So, what we now want to do is we want to find that DGP that best matches our data. Because once we know the DGP, we can forecast and so forth. So, what's the task formally? Or how do we approach this task formally? Two ways to go about this. So, let's call it method A. It's going to be our first approach. In method A, we will basically attempt to establish or to find that combination of DGP type and parameter values that best matches. So once we have a DGP type and para a particular parameter combination that exactly determines the autocorrelation function and the stationarity property, what we want to find is that best combination of DGP type and parameters that best matches the sample autocorrelation function and the data stationarity properties. So this is this is the task, okay? Basically matching the theoretical ACF of a DGP and parameter combination with the sample autocorrelation function. This approach is often called the Box Jenkins approach. It's not used that often anymore, but you will often find it still covered in detail in textbooks. There's a more modern approach, one would say. Let's call that B. What we do here is, well, basically, you know, we'll estimate different data generating process or different models to the data, and we find, we try to find that DGP type parameter combination that produces the smallest residual variance. Right? It's like basically finding the largest R squared in a in a regression. Right? We want to find the smallest. Now of course we know the more parameters we chuck in, so it means the higher order MA or highest order armor process will fit better. Therefore we need a trade off. We want the smallest residual variance traded off against the number of parameters. The way how we formalize that trade off is by what are called information criteria. And of course there's more detail to this approach which will be covered in another clip and of course in sections of textbooks and lecture notes. That's the information criteria approach.